Stephen. Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Rachel. I'll just share my screen. Can people see that now? Yes. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit today about um, a paper that we published last year um, on equity of access to NHS funded hip replacements uh, and how that changed over in England and Wales over the period from 2006 to 2016. Um, so there's a piece of work I did with three colleagues, um, um, uh, two from universities, one from um, the University of Bristol, the other from the University of Swansea, uh, and a colleague from the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital. So we worked together on this analysis uh, last year. Um, so a bit about hip replacements, first of all, I'm sure you know a lot about them already, but they're, they're, they're a sort of high volume procedure that the NHS pays for and, and delivers. We deliver about 100,000 or so hip replacements each year, elective hip replacements each year. Um, and it's regarded as a highly cost effective intervention. And it makes a big difference to people's lives. Almost everybody that has a hip replacement, not exclusively, but a very, very high proportion of people who have a hip replacement report that improves their quality of life. And the sort of standard measure for quality of life that we tend to use in the NHS is, is EQ5D, which rates people's uh, health status on a scale of naught to one, where naught is very poor health um, and one is perfect health. And on average, a hip replacement improves people's EQ5D score by um, 0.5. So a, a big, big increase on that scale. Um, it's also thought to be a highly preference sensitive um, uh, procedure in the sense that unlike, um, I don't know, a correction, if you've got a, a problem with your heart, for example, which people just tend to have done because the risks of not having it done are great. People often delay or defer having hip replacements, um, either because of the disruption that the procedure would cause to their daily life or the pain they might experience. Um, and, uh, and waiting times of hip replacements have been going up and up um, quite considerably, like all procedures over the last um, couple of years. Um, and quite a bit of work has been done in the past on equity of access to hip replacements. It's it's a procedure that's particularly amenable to that sort of analysis. So we wanted to look at whether equity of access um, had improved between 2006 and 2016. Um, so I'm going to focus mainly in the today on, on the, the results and the conclusions and implications um, rather than the methods, but I'm happy to answer questions about the methods that you use if, if people have any of those at the end. Before I start to talk about the piece of work itself, I just wanted to sort of um, Sort of make sure we're all on the same page in terms of this idea of equity and what it means and how we're going to think about it, in, particularly in relation to this paper. So I know, I'm guessing you're all very familiar with the concept, but just for the sake of a couple of slides, I'm just going to run through that quickly just to, to set the scene and, and make sure um, you know, we all have a sort of common understanding of the idea. So let's imagine that we have um, a, a three populations. So these might be populations that are defined by geography. Um, or they could be defined um, within a single geography by deprivation or ethnicity, for example. But they're, they're all distinct populations. And let's imagine for the sake of today that they all have the same size. These populations all contain 50,000 people. But the, um, the age structure of these populations might be very different. Some might have many more older people than others. Um, and the prevalence of particular diseases might be very variable across these populations. For some diseases, population A might, for example, have a high prevalence and for other conditions, population B might have a high prevalence. So although they're the same size, they might be very different in terms of their makeup and their health needs. Now let's think about um, the number of people in those populations who might benefit from, let's say, a hip replacement. Um, so, so let's imagine that a, a clinician has visited all these 150,000 people and put them through the same test to, ass to assess whether or not he thinks they, he or she thinks they might benefit from a hip replacement. And the clinician deduces that there are about 4,000 people in population A that might benefit from a hip replacement, 2,000 people in population B, and 1,000 people in population C. So the need for this condition, 
is greater in population A, the need for this procedure, sorry, is greater in population A than populations B or C. So the question is, if we had, let's say, 7,000 procedures to distribute across that population, how would we distribute those 7,000 procedures? Well, that seems fairly obvious. We should just distribute it in line with need. But I just want to make the point that we would distribute it in line with need, not in line with population size. Uh, if we have good data on need, and that should determine how we distribute the procedures across the populations, not population size or some other variable. Um, and now let's imagine that your budget's been cut and you've only actually got three and a half thousand procedures to distribute across the population. How should you distribute those three and a half thousand um, procedures? Well, if you're interested in equity um, and that's your objective, then um, you would simply halve the amounts you deliver to each of the populations. But the thing to note is that this, these relationships between need across populations, so the fact that population A has twice as much need as population B, and population C has half as much need as population B, those should be respected and replicated as we distribute services um, in each case. Irrespective of the amount of, amount of service that we have available, the amount of supply that might be available to distribute across the services, we'd always want to distribute them in line with need if we were interested in equity of provision. So that's just, just so the, the sort of principle of equity that we're going to assume for the conversation today is that the distribution of a service over a set of subpopulations should follow the distribution of need for that service. And clearly the distribution of need for one service will be very different from the distribution of need from another service. So you always need to take account of the need for the service if you can. Um, so in this study that we, we, we I'm going to talk about today, we looked at equity of access to NHS funded elective hip replacements, both primary and revision procedures. We were interested in understanding equity over quintiles of deprivation. So they're the five subgroup population subgroups um, grouped together according to levels of deprivation of the areas in which those people live. Um, we, did, we did this piece of work for both England and for Wales separately. Um, so that we could compare the results at the end. I'm going to mainly focus on the England results today, but again, if, if, if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about the results we got for Wales. Um, and, and we're going to look at it over uh, five time periods between 2006 and 2016. Um, for the purposes of the analysis, we, we had sort of two key data sources. Um, for need, we used the uh, English Longitudinal Study of Ageing. This is a very a well conducted long term longitudinal study that tracks the health and health status, healthcare use of a random sample of people aged over 50 in the English population. And as part of the study, um, periodically, every two years, in fact, they, they ask participants a series of questions. And amongst those questions are a subset that relate to their hip function from which we can derive something very similar to the Oxford HIP score, which is a clinically validated tool to assess somebody's need that's used to assess someone's need for a hip replacement. So they ask various questions about, you know, whether they can walk up and down stairs, impact on their, you know, how much pain they might be on a given day, for example. Uh, and they use that to derive a score and that score is used to determine whether or not someone might benefit from a hip replacement. Um, so we had this sort of, this particular research data set that allowed us to understand the distribution of need for hip replacements across quintiles of deprivation. Uh, and for supply, we look, use the hospital episode statistics, the sort of standard uh, data set equivalent to the sort of SUS data sets that you'll be familiar with. Um, and there was an equivalent data set that we used in Wales that has a very similar structure and records hospital activity in Wales. And from that, we were able to, to, to derive levels of supply um, of hip replacements by quintiles of deprivation. So I'm just going to show you some of the results now. Um, so this first chart here, um, so it, as you move the five dots on the chart, each relate to the quintiles of deprivation. So the 20% of the population that live in, on the left, the most deprived uh, areas, and on the right, the least deprived parts of the population in, in England. Um, and uh, what we're doing is we're comparing need 
for hip replacements relative to those people living in the middle quintile. So um, this dot here on the far left would suggest that people living in the most deprived areas are about 2.4 times more likely to need a hip replacement than somebody living in the middle quintile, having adjusted for age and sex. Um, whereas people living in the least deprived quintile are about 60% less likely to need a hip replacement than somebody living in the middle quintile, again, having adjusted for age and sex. So the need is, is on a sort of sharp gradient from most deprived to least deprived. Um, so if we had equity of supply, then we would expect the supply to follow a same distribution for the levels of supply of hip replacements to be also on a gradient from left to right, um, with more supply in the most deprived areas having adjusted for age and sex, and less supply on the right. In fact, what we get is this shape here, where the people living in the least deprived areas um, are actually the least likely to receive hip replacements, certainly less likely than people living in quintile three, and less likely than people living in quintile two. People living in quintiles four have about the same chance of receiving an NHS funded hip replacement as people living in quintile three, and people living in quintile five, the most affluent quintile, slightly less chance of receiving an NHS hip replacement than people living in quintile three. But the gradient, if it slopes at all, is in that direction. So we have a slope from left to right in terms of need, more need in population so in quintile one, and a slope from left to right, the other way around in, for, for, for supply. So higher levels of supply on average in the more deprived and in the least deprived areas. Um, and this is exactly the, the so this guy that um, uh, Rachel pointed out, he, he's, he's a guy called Julian Tudor Hart, and he wrote a paper in The Lancet um, 51 years ago where he described this idea of the inverse care law. And, he, and the idea of it was that the availability of good medical care tends to be inversely, um, tends to vary inversely with the need for the population served. So, um, you know, we would expect uh, supply to follow patterns of need if there was equity. In fact, what we get is the opposite. We see higher levels of supply in those areas that have the least need for it. And that's exactly what we're getting here with these, with these patterns for hip replacements. So this particular analysis, somebody else did a very, very thorough job of this analysis back in 2002 and published a very good paper in BMJ about it. But we were interested to see whether or not we'd seen any changes in this inequitable distribution of supply between 2006 and 2016. And the reason we were looking at that period is because there was, there was a lot of attention to about, about improving equity of access to services over that period. It covered two separate administrations, the, um, well, in fact, three separate administrations, the Labour administration from 2006 to 2011, the coalition um, administration followed by the Conservative administration. So um, there was opportunities, I guess, all, all those administrations were talking about uh, health inequalities and the need to improve equity of access to so hip replacements. And so we wanted to see whether or not those all those efforts that people had put in had, had, had borne fruit, whether or not we had seen an improvement in equity. And what we'd want to see, I suppose, is those these scissors, these blue and yellow scissors coming closer together, closing up so that need was tracking, uh, sorry, supply was tracking need more closely. That's what we would have hoped to have seen. And, and that could be achieved either by increasing levels of supply to the most deprived relative to the most to the least deprived or by reducing need by bringing the blue uh, the blue gradient more in line with the yellow gradient from a health service perspective we can control the distribution of supply uh, that is within our gift largely and so um, you know the easiest thing to do would to bring the yellow line up to the blue line if you come from a sort of public health background, you might be thinking, well, the best way to address this is to reduce levels of need in the most deprived areas. Why is it that people living in the most deprived areas need hip replacements to such a great extent? What is it about uh, their employment or their lifestyles which require that need, that level of ex ex advanced level of need? Um, but it, they're both options that are available to the country as a whole. But from a health service perspective, I suspect that the yellow line is more amenable to change in the short term.
Um, so the other thing to bear in mind is that between 2006 and 2016, we saw a really big increase in the level of supply. Um, so we actually saw this, these, this chart shows the level of supply of hip replacements going back from 2002 through to 2019, 18, sorry. So you can see a really big increase in levels of supply of NHS funded hip replacements by year. And in particular, from the period we're looking at, we saw almost a doubling of levels of supply, went from about 55,000 to something close to 110,000 procedures in 2016. Um, so there's ample opportunity to use that growth to address the problem of equity. All we really needed to do as a health service was make sure that that growth was focused predominantly on people living in the most in the most deprived areas and would have seen a closing up of the scissors we saw in the previous chart. Um, it wouldn't even have been necessary to reduce levels of supply to people living in the most in the least deprived areas. They just would have seen a slightly slower rate of growth. But we could have achieved uh, resolve the problems of equity if we would have just made sure that the extra 55,000 procedures that we chose to deliver in the NHS we distributed in a fashion which addressed the equity problem at baseline. So there's ample opportunity for us to address this problem. What happened? Well, if we looked at what the position was in 2006 on the left, we did the same analysis at 2016. We also looked at four intermediate points um, uh, between those two years. There is almost no change at all in those two gradients. There is some random variation, but generally speaking, the gradients don't change year, year to year. And we arrived at 2016 having doubled the level of supply, but managed to perpetuate um, the inequities in supply that we had at baseline. Um, so um, just, I suppose, a disappointing result, but it kind of emphasizes just how difficult it is to, to, to address these problems. We had we had the perfect opportunity to address this problem back in 2006. All the political will was there um, and and the money was there to, to, to increase supply in a way which would have addressed the problem, but we, for whatever reason, we didn't convert that. Um, so our conclusions in the, the paper itself was that there was substantial inequity in provision of NHS funded hip replacements in 2006. Um, and there's no evidence that we've managed to improve that inequity by 2016, despite the considerable increases in supply. And what we suggest in the paper is that sort of more potent policy interventions are required to improve equity of access. And I'll come back to that particular point at the end of the, end of the slides. I want to just address one other point quickly, because um, um, I think it's quite an interesting sort of tangent for this piece of work. So at the moment, I've been talking about the supply of NHS funded hip replacements. Um, but and we can think of the, the total market share of hip replacements to be divided into four quadrants. First of all, we can ask the question, who pays for the hip replacement? Is it paid for by the NHS or is it paid for privately? Individual might just choose to go to a private pro healthcare provider and pay for their hip replacement or they might have health insurance scheme which would pay for it for them. But nonetheless, the money comes from a private source rather than from the NHS. And we can also think about um, uh, whether or not it's the NHS that are delivering the hip replacement or whether it's a private sector provider that's delivering that hip replacement. So the NHS will pay for, you know, pays for hip replacements within its own hospitals, but it also pays for hip replacements within private hospitals. That would be category C. And I've been focusing in this report and to date on um, on that in the on on hip replacements in domain A and C. Um, but I wanted us just to think a minute about um, about the distribution of supply across those four domains. And I was going to ask a question on Menti. Um, and I was hoping Rachel might manage this for us now. So I wanted you to think, there's a couple of questions on Menti that I wanted to look at. And I'm asking you to think about the, the distribution of supply um, of hip replacements at two points in time. I can't remember what the two years are now off the top of my head, but it says on the Menti slide. Um, because it's quite, uh, I'm interested in your intuition about the distribution of supply across those four domains and whether or not it's changed over time. Um, so I'm going to hand you over back to Rachel now. Hopefully we'll guide us through the Menti question. I'll show you the answers in a minute. And this is really just a test. Um, I'm quite interested to know what people's intuition about these numbers is, because uh, 
it, when I first saw the numbers, it took me a little bit by surprise, and I wanted to check whether that was just my perspective or not. Uh, <clears throat> I've shared my screen, and it was uh, 2013 was the was the first year. Yeah. So I think you can distribute your market share over, over these four domains. And I think what it's going to show us is the average over all the people who, who respond. We get to see your answers, Rachel. That's good. Vote away. There's a second question about the later year. So if you if you move on to that one when you're ready. Pressure's on now, Rachel, because we can see what you're putting in. Everyone else can do it anonymously. You're on mute. You're on mute, Rachel. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you don't need to hear my thinking as well as see me thinking. I'll put the other screen back on. They're all wrong. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to write these down so that we can refer back to them. I'll show you the, what, what the market showing is. So, you should just print your screen like everyone else does. <laughs> I'm pen and paper, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's fine. So people's estimates oh, just changed slightly, but it's about 60% for A. That's NHS, NHS. 18% for C. 13% uh, for D. And 8% for B, which is privately funded but delivered in the NHS. OK, uh, can you move on to the next question, Rachel? So it's the same question, but instead of asking about 2013, now we'll ask the question about 2021. So do you think, whatever you put in before, do you think it's changed between 2013 and We got about 30 replies last time, didn't we? So we'll maybe we'll, we'll wait until we get roughly the similar number. Yeah, time. Just, just wait a minute. As you can see by my face, one has to think about these things. This is testing the wisdom of the crowd, isn't it? Because we're getting the average response over a number of respondents. Mm. So let's see. And some people will be may have done some work specifically on this, and some people will just sort of mm. be gauging yes. it from their own experience or what people they know, or just a, a feeling about what's happening in general the private market and people's own funds etc the price of butter comes to mind <laughs> so we we're still getting a few coming in are we is that right uh, we've got 26 yeah we've got 20 most people have, re have responded okay so we've got well. i'm going to write these down now at this point so 48 for a 24 for c 17 for d and 11 for b so People are saying that the NHS to NHS category has gone down from 60 to 48, and all of the other categories have increased by a few percentage points. That's what people are guessing at. Right, shall I go back to and share, share my screen again now, Rachel? Is that all right? Mm -hmm. um, are you going to reveal the answers? I will, yeah, yeah. Um, There we go. So that's the that's the slide we're on before. So th this is the position in 2013. So um, people's guesses were here here were 60% for NHS NHS. So we underestimated the proportion that was paid for and delivered within the NHS. Um, we guessed that 8% for for delivered in the NHS but paid for privately. That was only 1% in 2013. And uh, I guess for C was NHS funded uh, was 18%. So I guess here was very close to the, to the real answer. And for D, I guess was 13%. So very close to the real answer here. So um, if there's a, you know, if we if we made an error, it was in the allocation of these two. We probably underestimated this number and overestimated this number here in blue. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to show you now what the position was in 2000 and, um, and 2021. So the first thing to note is that we saw a big reduction uh, in this NHS to NHS category. It went down to 50%. Our guess on the Avenzi chart was 48, so very, very close. And we were right in the sense that um, that the, the loss of market share, NHS to NHS market share, was essentially redistributed to the other categories. Um, some of it went to privately privately delivered but NHS funded. Some of it went from uh, to privately funded and privately delivered, and a small amount extra went from um, NHS funded to sorry NHS delivered but privately funded. So we saw a sort of loss of market share from the green sector into all the other sectors. That's what happened. And just to show you that as a time series. Um, from 2013, this number had been trending down. This is the number of PIP replacements that are delivered for and paid for by the NHS. And it sharply declined from 2019. This will be the first COVID year, isn't it? So this is the consequence of COVID and the impact, I'm guessing, on waiting times. But the big winner has been this private-private category. So yes, there have been increases in this NHS-funded, privately delivered category. And those have been slow and gradually trending upwards. But the big change in more recent years is this trade off between NHS funded and NHS delivered care to privately funded, uh, privately delivered care. That's the, been the main trend in the market share that's happened over the last few years. And just a bit about the if you're going to pay for your own hip replacement. I mean, it depends who you go to and you can probably pay as much as you want, but, you know, it's, it's going to cost you to, somewhere between 10 and 15,000 pounds, something of that order. So it's a considerable expense if you're paying for it out of your own pocket. And so it's probably fair to conclude that the people who do choose to go private and pay for their own hip replacements are those people living in the more affluent areas, the least deprived areas. Um, so if we think again about these charts here, what we're showing here on this yellow line is the supply of NHS funded hip replacements. If I was able to show the, the supply of all hip replacements, including the private one, privately funded ones, I'm pretty sure that these two yellow dots would be above the black line here and on a, on a trajectory upwards. And that, that would have sharpened by 2016 because of these the general trends towards private sector provision as wait, NHS waiting times had increased. So. Um, we're getting a relatively shallow gradient if we just look at the NHS funded hip replacements. If we were able to look at all hip replacements, including privately funded ones, I'm pretty sure that we'd see a much sharper gradient in this yellow line. So if anything, this underestimates the inverse care law. It's probably it's probably worse than it currently is. And it's probably actually got worse rather than not, not improved. That would be my conclusion. If we were to look at the total supply of hip replacements. So that was all I was going to mention today. I just wanted to sort of draw your attention to a couple of other reports that we've done. These are more general reports if you're interested in the topic um, uh, that we published over the last couple of years. The report on the left focuses more on uh, where and why we see inequities in access to planned hospital care, not specifically hip replacements, but all forms of planned hospital care. And the report on the right is more focused on helping health systems think through how they might address that problem. Um, ways to think about it and ways to address the problem. Um, and they're available on our website if, you, if you're interested in. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to sort of hand back over to Rachel now to any sort of questions or comments that people have. That's the um, uh, the reference at the bottom if people want to look at, look at the paper itself. As I said, I'm happy to answer questions on methods as well as sort of the con sort of context and what can be done about it if that would be useful. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. That's uh, that is very interesting. I think the subject matter, uh, as as many of us know, has been covered in um, different guises uh, over the years, um, quite thoroughly. But it's just that simple presentation. I think sometimes what you miss is the key points. So I think what you what you've done is uh, rather nicely capture um, that cause that, uh, that change over time. So we do have um, have a couple of questions. I've I've put the just before I go to Max in a sec. Um, I have put the mentee up for those who aren't able to access the chat box and who, and who would uh, rather sort of 
interact like that. So you can go to Menti and ask a question there if you'd like. Uh, there's a couple of questions here. So first, I think Jacqueline was first. Jacqueline says, and hers is in the chat, Stephen. She says, uh, just a query about what about patients with employers' private health insurance? Would that be private, private? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. distinguishing the things that the NHS pays for from all of the sources of funding, which I, for the purpose of this presentation are classified as private. But that would include employee insurance schemes, yes, yeah. employer insurance schemes. Thank you. And uh, a query which I can't think Matthew. are increasingly common. Is, is I mean, they're not they're not nowhere near as common as they are in the states, but but they're yeah. increasingly common. I think forms of insurance perks that private companies they have been, employers offer to employees in some situations. Matt. Uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting. That's because it's really interesting for me because. Um, uh, well, two, three years ago, I was working with a, a CSU um, to do with kind of how the, looking at kind of um, where they were out of whack with similar CCGs and looking at kind of patient outcomes and, and costs and all that sort of thing that obviously CCGs focus on. And one of the conclusions they came to, and I was wondering if Steve ever has ever s seen this as part of his study, we found that actually the CCG we were working with when we compared it with others was actually... Um, over, I don't know, what, oversupplying hip and knee replacements. And what they actually found was they were um, giving hip and knee replacements to patients who were kind of an earlier stage or younger. The first thing was that patients, their kind of benefits they found from it were less, not mm. because they were the, the, wasn't successful, but because they weren't, uh, they weren't, they didn't need it so much in the first place. Yes. And they yeah. actually found they were over, um, they were oversupplying both hip and knee replacements. And this was a part of, this is one of the areas where they were out of whack and was causing them extra, extra costs. I was just yep. wondering if that's something Steve found in, in, in see, you found in your, your analysis. So, so essentially in, in our study, we were looking at the equity of the distribution of supply rather than uh, the concept of over or under supply, which I think is what you're getting at, Matthew, which, which is only, yep. um, which is something separately that we have done a bit of work on in the past. Um, my, so um, it's a complicated area, that issue of over and supply. It's, it's an odd, hip replacements were an oddity in that they seem both very well evidence-based. Um, and there's good evidence that there's under supply in some communities. Um, but there's also a concern that there may be oversupply in some cases to some communities as well. So um, the, and, and, and when... When the, the one thing we have with hip replacements that we don't have for many other procedures is that we have reasonably good data on on the outcomes that patients experience because we record their patient reported outcome measures before and after the procedures carried out and i think what you're you're absolutely right in that um the benefits that people get from a hip replacement are in part a function of their hip uh performance at baseline so if they mm. if they go into a hip procedure with fairly good hip function, the opportunity to improve it through a hip replacement is is reduced, is limited. Uh, yeah. and, and so that would give you, there's a tendency then to say, well, let's wait and wait for people to get, you know, there's a hip function to be really poor before we, and we set the threshold then for surgery uh, at a very, very poor hip function. So that we can be pretty sure we would always get a, a benefit for those patients. And there's greater opportunity for improvement but you are trading off in that respect two things. One is that um, um, you're expecting people to live with more pain and discomfort for longer so that you can be confident that when they do have their hip replacement, they'll get some benefit. And you're also delaying, you're reducing the, the lifespan of the potential benefit for the intervention. Mm. So if you're waiting for people to get their hip function to deteriorate, you're effectively getting close, they're getting closer to their natural lifespan as well and so the opportunity for the for the for that hip replacement to deliver benefit over the life of the patient is also reduced there's also some been some fairly good work by matt sutton and others at the university of manchester which suggests that um all of the things equal if you delay somebody's care then you essentially lose health gain in the longer term there'll be a lower limit to that you shouldn't, you know, can't be operating on everybody with good hips. But at the level we're currently operating at, I think the suggestion is that we could operate sooner for, for, for a lot of people mm -hmm. and get greater gain over the lifespan of the, of the individual. It's a real, it's not, it's not a debate that's, 
it's fun as far as that's something that's like a bit of an open debate still i think when exactly you should you should intervene um uh, and, and whether we've got the threshold right generally on average and across different sort of populations i think what our paper is suggesting is that those thresholds are very different in some populations than others and for whatever reason we're operating later in the progression of the disease people living in more deprived areas than people living in more affluent areas I, I think that that was in some ways i think that was a conclusion that was come to was it, it was their assessment of need that was out of whack with with other kind of C, other similar ccgs um and they were maybe there was people aren't using or people whatever methods are, i mean that's something something i'm not going to be an but maybe there's something about the assessment of need that's not being mm. applied equally across, across yep. different areas yeah because that's the other aspect of equity you'd kind of expect that geographically across the country similar thresholds were being applied and what you're suggesting is that in that particular ccg they were they were operating at lower lower clinical thresholds yeah. than others uh, which is which is a different form of unfairness, but it's still a, it's still it's it's an important aspect of equity, isn't it? Um. Thanks. Okay, thank thanks, Matt. Uh, we do have a, a couple of uh, questions, so uh, I think it's probably easier if I share my screen, Stephen, and you can pick out the ones that you want. We've got plenty of time to answer them, uh, so I'll, I'll I'll do that now. Here we go. Uh, where do you think inequalities based on waiting time should be equitable? So where in the system are the inequalities? Yeah, so there's there's a there was another piece of work that we've done. I, I think this is going to address the question that was asked. But um, uh, in that yellow report that I showed in the in the final slide, we looked at um, inequities over a pathway, which ended with a elective procedure, and in particular, we looked at the pathway that led to people having hip replacements. And we tried to say, was there evidence that care was inequitable, even at early stages of the pathway, when people's arthritis, for example, was diagnosed by their GP, when sort of lower level interventions were delivered by the, by the GP, at the point at which they were referred into secondary care. Actually, the evidence from that piece of work, and it was, I guess, it wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as definitive, it was illustrative, but underpinned by some data was that the inequities tended to emerge quite late in the pathway after patients have been referred to secondary care and i think what i mean this is again me speculating now being clear i'm not is, my, my my perspective is that um at the point when patients are referred into secondary care and a decision needs to be made about whether or not to go to go ahead with a hip replacement um i think two things are happening i think there's possibly issues with the nature of the consultation between a patient and their clinician, which is potentially suboptimal for people living in more deprived areas. I also think there's, um, you need to think about if the patient's making a decision in their life context about whether to go, with, go ahead with a hip replacement, they need to take account of things like, am I looking after somebody? And can I afford not to look after them for a couple of weeks while I recuperate from my hip replacement? Am I going to lose earnings, income from not being able to work? Will my employer allow me to take the time off work? Um, how do I get into the um, hospital in the first place? How do I get there? You know, you can probably get a quicker hip replacement in the private sector if you're prepared to travel a bit further. But that, obviously, there are cost implications of that and travel and logistical problems. Um, when I get back home, who's going to look after me? You know. And all of those things tend to skew towards people living in more affluent areas. If, you, if you've got a, an easy, if you've got better employment conditions, you've got less care and responsibilities, and you've got more disposable income, then you can re, you're, you're able to resolve those problems more easily. Living in a more deprived area with less income stability and less employment stability and maybe more caring responsibilities and less cover for things like respite and recuperation, then maybe your decision is not to go ahead with the surgery or to delay it. And I think that's what's playing out partly in these numbers. And if so if and that means if we're going to address the problem of inequity of supply, we need to address those those problems. And and, and that means the NHS getting involved in the the sort of minutiae of people's lives, maybe thinking about how we can pay for people's travelling expenses a bit more easily or whether we might have to um, I don't know, facilitate their travel or 
uh, and, uh, in guarantee aftercare arrangements for them, for example, so that they know they're going to get care at home for a period of time and there's respite care for their young ones or for their elderly relatives they might be looking after. Those are the sorts of complicated debates I think we're going to get into and the more potent policy actions that I, I mentioned earlier in the slide if we're going to really address the problem. Um, so I've taken a long time to answer one question there, actually, but I hope that answers the question. Um, what is the analytical role here? I'm trying to understand what might be underlying that question. Um, what's the role of an analyst in trying to address the problem? Is that is that it? I think part, if that's the question, I think partly it's about exposing the problem as best we can and unpicking it as much as we can so that decision makers get as good an insight into the, both the nature, the, the, the scale of the problem, but also the nature of it. Um, um, but also about thinking about through potential solutions to the problem so that we don't just stop at, you know, this is this is what we found. We, we're actually proposing some potential interventions to address inequity as well. Um, in the paper, for example, we, we talked about whether or not there might be a case for changing payment mechanisms so that providers who work with patients from more deprived areas receive a higher tariff. And maybe that tariff could be used in part to ensure that, we, we, that the provider can cover some of the travel expenses or out-of-pocket expenses that the, the individual incurs. So I, yeah, maybe that, I, I th if that's the question, then I think that's, that's my best go as an answer, um, both to highlight the, the scale of the problem, but also its, its nature, and then to think about what the solutions might look and feel like. Um, does a model health system deliver any of this kind of analysis regularly? I don't know. Um, other people will know that system better. Maybe others can answer that question on the chat if they, they know it. Um, I think um, the core 20 plus 5 dashboards might be slight getting into this territory, whether they sit within model hospital or a model health system or other place, I'm not sure. Can some of this be automated and shared regularly as an output? Um, Yes, I think you could, and you could you could do it at some geographical levels, I think. So we've just done it for England and Wales, but we, you could look at it at smaller geographies. You get more noise and more uncertainty in those outputs, so they'd be slightly more difficult to interpret, I suppose, um, slightly more equivocal. But uh, yeah, I think that could it could certainly be done. The, um, the data from ELSA, you have to get permissions to use those data sets, but that's just an application. And waiting a few months for them to approve it and sign it off, but it can be done. Or we could we could access that on your behalf and somehow make that available too if it was useful um, in in a form which doesn't uh, result in any sort of patient disclosures or individual disclosures. Um, surely funding for hip replacements for an area are allocated depending on the demographic, i.e., more pounds than more pounds in older areas. Yes, they absolutely are, but they're allocated on mass, aren't they? They're not allocated specifically for hip replacements. And so an area with higher levels of need um, would get higher levels of funding. How it chooses to distribute that funding um, is up to it, whether it chooses to, you know, to, to use it to try and less address need or supply, whether it's adequate to address the differences in need. There's another question. There's a lot of date debates about the adequacy of the need adjustments in those funding allocations. Um, so yes, but you're right, uh, uh, that, that's that's the national government solution to this problem. We've given, we've distributed the funding to local areas, we've taken account of need as best we can, we distributed that funding, debates about the fairness of that, but we have done that. Over to you now to, to, to think about how you supply services to, so that there isn't an inequity of supply. So. The government could argue it's done its bit and it's down to local areas to think about how it uses its funding to address this problem. Do you think the transition away from NHS funded delivered treatment towards private is especially large for hip replacements as compared to other routine elective procedures? Um, well, I don't know, to be honest, because we don't have good data on, on procedures per se, or at least we haven't until fairly recently. I got the data I shared you, with you, and I should have said this, comes from the National Joint Registry, and they do collect good data and have done on privately funded hip replacements. They collect quite a lot of data on those. 
and I can be pretty confident that there's a pretty high degree of completeness in those submissions. But we don't we don't have equivalent data, or at least haven't recently, for things like cataracts, where I suspect there's an even greater proportion of privately funded, privately delivered procedures. Or, I don't know, lung volume reduction procedures, where I suspect the market share for private provide, private is much lower because of the needs for, I don't know, uh, intent, uh, intensive care or afterwards. Um, but there is a data set that's been published quite recently. It's called FIN, P-H-I-N. It's on the internet. Uh, you can access it. It's in a public domain, which does attempt to give some more information about the um, private private market, the privately, the privately funded market. Um, I'm still getting to grips with that data set. I'm not sure I fully understand how it's constructed and how much to trust it. But it is... Uh, it's an official data set, mandatory now that all private providers submit data through that route. And I think that's going to be a useful source of information to us in the future. I'm thinking about using it because I suspect that um, the waiting list challenge that we've got, although enormous, is being ameliorated to some extent by the fact that some people have chosen to go private. And as we bring managed to bring uh, our waiting times, if we ever do, if we manage to bring them back down again to something more reasonable, there will be a, 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 a reverse effect where people who would otherwise have paid for their care privately come back to the NHS. That seemed to be what happened in the in the early 2000s when um, uh, when we managed to manage down waiting times considerably. People that would have gone private chose to come back to the NHS. I suspect we'll have the same issue when we, if and when we address the waiting times this time, and that's going to make the challenge even more difficult because we're not just dealing with um, managing down waiting times for a fixed pool. The pool of patients coming to us will increase, um, and every time we manage to bring down waiting times, more people will come across back to the NHS. So I think that, I think I'd, I want to try and use that bin data set or maybe the National Joint Registry to try and get a handle on that problem and get a sense of the scale of the issue that it might cause for us. A few years down the line, when we're, if and when we're making track, getting traction on the waiting times again. Um, uh, what role for an acute trust, acute hospital here, as opposed to say tracking it being tackled at an ICS decision making? That's an inter really interesting question. Is it is it whose problem is this to solve? Is it is it an acute hospital's problem, or is it you know is it GPs and the their referring rates, or is it ICS's, their sort of population health management responsibilities? I think I think there probably is an argument that acute trusts need to get deeply involved in this debate. And the trust that's out there that seems to be making some really deliberate and brave attempts to address it, uh, I'm not saying exclusively, I'm sure there's lots of trusts, but the one that gets a lot of attention is UHCW, the University Hospitals of Coventry in Warwickshire, who are who are experimenting with different ways of um, prioritising patients on waiting lists to try and address uh, some of the inequities that we see at baseline. So I do think acute trusts have a role um, and need to embrace this as part of their um, responsibilities rather than waiting for public health or the ICS to address the problem. I don't think it's going to be resolvable without the acute sector's um, sort of, uh, Considered considerable efforts here. Yeah. Why are patients choosing to fund the hip replacements privately? It's it's almost certainly down to waiting times. I think if you as waiting times increase, I think people are more likely to pay for them privately because they can they can know they can get quick care quicker than waiting maybe a year or even two years possibly for treatment. Um, so yeah, I think that's what's happening. Um, that's probably almost certainly the main driver of people going private. Um, disposable income has been going down, I think, on average, um, as cost of living prices have gone up and mortgage fees have gone up. So it's not that probably, although there is probably a subset of the population that's um, protected from those effects by high levels of income or historical wealth. But I think, generally speaking, it's unlikely to be disposable income trends that are causing that privately funded trend. It's um, it's more likely to be waiting times in the NHS that's behind it. Right. Um, I think we've um, pretty much hit uh, the end of our wonderful session today, uh, Stephen. So I would just like to say thank you very much for
uh, your presentation today and I'm assuming if people do have queries that they can come directly to you. Of course, to yeah. Me. Yeah. Uh, I think we've covered most questions. There was one about has it uh, has it been repeated um, after 2016? I think there was some information on, on trends after that, but not not that exact uh, the analysis that you started off by presenting. Uh, I'm not going to let you answer that. That's really mean. I know. <laughs> um, so uh, and I'm, I'm thinking um, there may be a, a, an appetite for our huddlers to have more information uh, about some of the techniques that you've used, uh, the approaches that you've taken in this as well, so that maybe we could present that at a different session. And I don't think you've been here and presented the actual paper on the strategies to reduce inequities in access to electric care. I know, there's, I know you've been ev all sorts of different places with that, but I don't think you've come here with that. I think that I think that might be something that people would be interested, i.e., what to do about it and 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 where where we're at with with those those approaches. Okay, well, brilliant. I'm just I'm just going to whiz through these last couple of slides uh, before before we finish. So I just mentioned already the Health and Care Analytics Conference. It's a, a, a big sellout, uh, early early doors. We'll, we'll have to do get a bigger place next year. Um, next uh, next couple of huddles, we've got uh, uh, Dan Isaac. He's going to be telling us about his um, up and coming data visualization courses. Unfortunately, they, well, fortunately and unfortunately, they are completely booked out about uh, four, four times uh, thrice over, which simply means I will uh, accommodate your uh, your needs and we'll, we'll get some more dates booked in for that. Uh, so do come along and see what it's about anyway. Uh, we're finding out more about the data science team with Chris Beely and Zoe and the NHSE are presenting the ICB place based allocation tool in a, in a couple of sessions time. As I mentioned before, the new perspectives is out. Uh, some some spaces do go quickly and I particularly want to draw your attention to uh, this course here. So this is a three day course. Um, this is the third year we've been running this. It, it, um, people really like this um, and, and I think it will now have this is the first time I'm sharing it with um, a big audience, uh, if you like, and I'll be emailing about it afterwards as well. So this is the time series forecasting and decision making using R with Barman um, from Cardiff University. And this this um, starts on the 28th of June and it's for three days. So get that sorted with your line managers now, uh, get the registration form completed and yes, having or use a user of R is useful, but if you are new to R, there are course preparation resources available for you to get um, ready for that for that course as well. OK, so get registering. All right, I'm, I'm a massive three minutes over, um, but it was worth it. And uh, thanks again, Stephen. Thanks everyone for coming and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thanks, Paul.